Hey guys, how are you doing? Are you ready for, for your exams? No. <laughs> yeah, it was much nicer at the end of August, you know. The semester was just beginning and the weather was so nice. Now it's winter time in Berkeley, which means like 60 degrees or something. 55. So, uh, today is the review lecture, okay? Um, in the last few lectures, I gave you an overview from the kind of a theoretical point of view of what this course is about, and in particular, this last chapter that we have studied. And today, I would like to focus more on the practical aspects of, of it, and uh, basically on the question, what do you need to know to do well on the final exam? Okay? So I'll go over the most important points of the material which we'll focus on on the final exam, which, again, will be on... December 19th, and um, I'm not going to go over all the information again. Everything is available on, uh, on, online, uh, here, and also on vSpace. I will, I will also have last-minute office hours uh, the day before, on the 18th, in case you, uh, you know, suddenly don't see the difference between curl and divergence. And you panic <laughs> the night before. You can come to uh, see me on, uh, on the 18th and we'll sort it out. I'll sort it out for you. Okay. Um, also, I want to uh, tell you one more time that the exam will be at Hearst Gym in three different rooms, okay? And uh, you will, uh, the room is determined by your section is determined by who, who your GSI is. And your GSIs have already announced the, room, the rooms for, for you, but you can find all this information again here and here. Okay? But you, you should be aware of where your exam room is. It's important that you are at the right place. And you don't end up in a, uh, you know, it's first gym, so it's big and uh, it's easy to get lost. So be, be sure you know which room you should, uh, you should show up at. Okay. Any questions about the organizational aspects of the, of the final? Okay, good. So now let's talk about the material. I already um, said that this exam will focus on the material um, after the second midterm, what we call the third season. And, but it doesn't mean that you should forget what happened in the first two seasons meaning that certainly problems, solving all the problems will require skills which you learned before. You should not forget all this stuff, right? Especially multiple integrals are a very important uh, part of, the, of, this, of, of this material. So I think it's a good idea to go over that old material, perhaps not devote as much time as the material of the last chapter, which we've studied since the last exam. But... Uh, you should probably re review it nonetheless. Any questions from this part of the audience? No? Okay. Now, so I would like to break it into um, the material. So I will only talk about the material since the last exam. But again, don't take it as meaning that you should not know anything about what happened before. You should, uh, but the focus will be on this material. Okay, that's why I'm going over this material now. All right, so the first thing I would like to talk about is integrals. In this, uh, in this uh, part of the course, we have talked about different kinds of integrals, and I would like to summarize again what those integrals are and what kind of information you need to be able to compute them. So the first thing I want to focus on is, is just the integrals. What kind of integrals? Well. We integrate over curves and we integrate over surfaces. So there are two types of integrals, first of all, depending on the dimension of the domain. Let me talk first about integrals over curves. Over curves. So here we have two types of integrals also. The type one integral is an integral of a function so this is an integral which looks like this. You have f ds, where f is a function 
over curve. So a curve here could be over, uh, um, could be a, uh, a curve on the plane that is R2 or in space. On the plane or in space. But the way we handle these integrals is very similar. Now, how do we compute such an integral? So to compute such an integral, the first step is to parameterize your curve. Parameterize the curve. So, which, by the way, was the very first uh, subject that we learned in this course. So this is a good example of what I mean when I say, you know, revisit, uh, review the material from the previous chapters. Because certainly to be able to do such an integral, you have to know how to parameterize curves. And that's something we learned at the very beginning. Okay. So parameterizing, parameterizing the curve means means introducing an auxiliary parameter, which we usually call t, but you may call it something else if you like, in writing each of the coordinates as functions of this auxiliary parameter. So you would have x as a function of this parameter t, y as a function of this parameter t, and z as a function of this parameter t. That would be in the case when the curve is in space, if it's on the plane, it, the, you would only have x and y, of course, right? And once you do that, this integral, ah, and then you have to say that t, what is the range for this auxiliary parameter t? And the range will be between some numbers a and b. So then this integral will be equal to the integral of f, where instead of x, y, and z, you introduce, you insert those three functions, x of t, y of t, and z of t, right? And you integrate from A to B. But in addition, you also have to insert a factor which has to do with the arc length of the curve. And that would be the following. X prime of T squared plus Y prime of T squared plus Z prime of T squared. And finally, DT. And again, if you are on the plane, you just don't have the Z variable. You just erase this, but, and then you get the formula for, on the plane. Now, what does this represent? This represents a mass of, uh, say, a thin wire in the shape of, of this curve, in the shape of this curve, if f is a density function, is mass density function. Also, remember that if f is equal to 1, if f is, is equal to 1, in other words, you just, you just have the square root, this integral represents simply the arc length, arc length of the curve. So this integral, this integral measures um, the total mass or total length of this, um, of this object, this curve. Okay, that's what this integral is about. It's very easy to distinguish this integral from the next type of integral because you see that in this integral you integrate functions. Whereas the second type of integral, you integrate vector fields. So in the second type, you have an integral of a vector field rather than function. F is a vector field. So as such, it has components. I, uh, in front of I, you have P. In front of J, you have Q, and then you have a third component, R. If this is a vector field on the, on, in space, if it's on the plane, again, you only have two components. Okay? So vector field is uh, more than a function. It's, it has three components in space, two components on the plane. And this integral can be also rewritten as P dx plus Q dy plus R dz. This is the same. This is the same. Right? Because the dr here stands for dxi plus dyj plus dzk. And so if you take the dot product of these two, you end up with this formula. So these are two different ways to write um, 
uh, aligned integral of a vector field, either this way or that way. It's the same. Okay. In the case of a, of a line integral of a vector field, there is an additional complication, which we don't have for integrals of this type. For integral of this type is enough to just write this. You have to specify the curve, you have to specify the function, and that's it. But in the case of a line integral of a vector field, you have to, you have to specify additional piece of data, so which I, kind of, I want to emphasize. It. Here you need orientation. Of, C. of course, when I say you need to specify, what I really mean is that I need to specify it. In other words, when I give you, if I give you a problem, compute this line integral, I have to tell you with respect to which orientation. Okay? If, I'm, if I don't tell you, it means that the problem is not well posed, unless you have to find, unless, you know, there's something said which should enable you to find the orientation. In other words, this is not well defined if you just have the vector field and the curve, you have to also have orientation on this curve. What do I mean by orientation? A curve is going to, be, to look like this. So it goes from some point A to point B. And orientation means the direction, which way do we traverse this curve? So there are two possible orientations. Here's one orientation, and here's another orientation. We can go from A to B, we can go from B to A. And of course, the answer, if you choose the first orientation, is going to be just a negative of the answer if you use, choose the second orientation. But it's a different answer. Unless the integral is just zero, you will get different answer depending on which orientation you choose. So orientation has to be specified, and you have to follow that orientation. So you have to be careful when you set up such an integral to make sure that you are computing it in the right direction. You're doing it, the integral oriented in the right, in the right way. Of course, here I have drawn a curve which has two endpoints. There are also curves which do not have endpoints. Closed curves. Here's an example of a closed curve. In the case of a closed curve, it also has two orientation, two orientations, which we usually call clockwise and counterclockwise. Right? So counterclockwise is this one. There is also a somewhat misleading terminology in the book which is called positive orientation, which I would prefer not to use because it's positive, it, it's, an, it's a matter of convention, right? So, so let's just call it counterclockwise or clockwise. In the book, counterclockwise is also called positive. But I think it's, uh, it, there's potential for, uh, for misunderstanding if you use that terminology. So let's just stick to clockwise, counterclockwise. I think it's, fairly, it's very self-explanatory. Okay. Now, let's say, let's suppose you have this. Um, you have chosen, chosen such an orientation. What will be, um, what will this, how to compute this integral? So, there, you use, again, parametrization like this. But now, it's important to make sure that your orientation that you've chosen is, um, agrees with the orientation on the auxiliary parameter t. This T is actually, it just belongs to the one-dimensional space, to the line. And the line is oriented because points on the line correspond to numbers. And numbers are oriented. We can say which number is bigger uh, between any two numbers. So when we write it like this, it means that we, we identify the curve with the interval from A to B. And the interval from A to B is always oriented from A to B like this, right? So. Let's suppose that under this parameterization, you choose the orientation like this. So it goes from this point to this point. And this point is t equal a, and this point is t equal b. Okay? Let's suppose that. In this case, this integral... is computed as an integral from a to b of p x prime t dt, well, let's just write like this, plus q y prime plus r z, z prime dt. But here is a, here's a possible trick question. Let's suppose I will ask you on the exam 
to compute such a line integral where the curve is oriented in a different way. Okay? So if you don't pay attention, you would say, okay, that's just, a, you, you would find your parameterization where again, let's say t equal a corresponds to this and t equal b corresponds to this. Let's suppose. And then you, if you don't pay attention to this stuff, to the orientation, you might want to write it again like this. That would be wrong, you see, because you have to make sure that with respect to the orientation which you are told to use, the, the parameterization is such that, you know, the, the lowest one is the initial point, the lowest value, A, is the initial point, and the larger, largest value, B, is, corresponds to the end point. In this picture, that's the case, and that's why we end up with this integral from A to B. That, in other words, the integral that I got with respect to T has this orientation, which comes from the orientation of the curve. But if the orientation is like this, you have to go from t equal b to t equal a, right? Because you have to go from this point to this point. This point corresponds to t equal b. This point corresponds to t equal a. That's why, so in this case, then you should write it as from b to a, and then the same thing. Then, of course, what is integral from b to a? Integral from b to a is the same as negative integral from a to b. So you will actually end up with minus this integral, okay? Is that clear? Ask me if it's not clear. So this is a, this is a subtle point, which you have, to, you have to remember. Now, what does, this, what does this integral represent? Interpretation of this integral is that it, it represents uh, work done by force. This is work done by force. by force F along C from the point A to the point B. You see, from this, if you think about this interpretation, it's, um, it becomes more, um, it becomes more clear why there's a sign. Because when you talk about the work done by force, the force is moving an object, or it may be resisting a movement of the object, right? And, and so it's important if, whether you go from A to B or from B to A. If the force, let's say the force, let's say the force is, comes from the wind, and the wind is blowing this way. And so the, the wind is carrying me this way, so the, the wind does, does perform a certain amount of work, right? And this work is positive. But what if the wind is blowing this way, but I'm still, I still insist on going there, okay? Because I'm stubborn, so I, I go against the wind. So in that case, I, I, pref I do work, not the wind, and so the wind is resisting me, therefore the work of the wind is negative, you see? So it's important to know not just the trajectory of the object, but, but it's also important uh, the, the, uh, you, you know, whether the relative position of the force and the, and the trajectory. In other words, the orientation of the trajectory relative to the uh, direction of the vector field. You see, so, that, so it becomes more clear that if, if I go this way, uh, if I go this way against the wind, it's a negative uh, uh, work. If I go this way with the wind, it will be positive, okay? You have a question? That's right, that's right. When I write it like this, so the question is about this PQR. In this formula, I spelled it out. I wrote F as, of, F is a function of X, Y, Z, but now X, Y, Z have become functions of T, so I substitute these three functions into F. Likewise, in this formula, I didn't write it just to save time, but what I mean by this is like this. And the same, same, similar for for Q and R, uh, for Q and R, <coughs> okay? So the orientation is important. It causes change of orientation uh, results in the, in the appearance of the sign. Okay, so that's, that's pretty much all about the setup of integrals for curves. So next we move on to integrals over surfaces.
integrals over surfaces. So what do we need to know here? Here, again, there are two types of integrals that we are interested in. And there is a, a lot of similarity between the first type for surfaces and the first type for curves, and the second type for surfaces and, and second type for curves. So the first integrals of the first type over surfaces are integrals of functions. So here, again, f is a function. And uh, in this case, uh, you have a surface M, and it is embedded in R3. You could also have a surface embedded in R2. That would be just a, a region on the plane, like this, right? But that's, so that's integrating over such regions was the subject of uh, the earlier chapter of the course, chapter 15. These are just the usual double integrals. So here the novelty is when you look at surfaces in R3, which do not fit in R2, which cannot fit in a plane, but only fit in a three-dimensional space, like a sphere or part of a sphere. Right? So what I'm talking about is something like this. Like a cap, a cap like this. That would be M. So what, what does, uh, how do I compute this? Again, um, to compute, I have to parameterize my surface. Parameterize. Because it is now two-dimensional, I have to use two auxiliary parameters, which we usually call u and v. And so we write x is some function of u and v y is some function of u and v, and z is some function of, of u and v, where u and v run over points of some domain already on a plane. So what I'm doing is that I'm trying to identify a curved surface like this, like this m, with a flat surface like this, which I call d. So each point here would correspond to a point here. And it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. That's what this parameterization uh, means. Once you have this parameterization, you have a formula for, um, for this integral. To write this formula, I will use the following notation. I'll call R of uv the vector field which is obtained from this parameterization by interpreting each of the three functions, x, y, and z, as components of a, of a three vector. So you will have x of u, v, i plus y of u, v, j plus z of u, v, k. This is vector r. And so to I can differentiate this vector. For example, r sub u will simply mean uh, x sub u times i plus y sub u times j plus z sub u times k. So again, this stands for partial derivative of x with respect to u. These are partial, derivative, partial derivatives with respect to u. So this is, a, this, is, this is another example of something which we use in this part of the course. We're building on some material that we learned before. Because, of course, we learned uh, partial derivatives earlier, right? Before the second exam. So, the, so again, you have to know, how, for example, how to compute partial derivatives. Without knowing how to compute partial derivatives, you would not be able to compute such integrals. Once, OK, so once we have this, we also have r sub, r sub v. Defined in a similar way, you just put derivatives with respect to v instead of u. Then the formula is the following. Ah, I actually made the, I, I only drew one sign of integration. I should have drawn two, two signs of integration. For double integrals, we draw two signs. Well, it's not a big deal. 
I will not deduct points for this, since I've, I've made the same mistake. So uh, I'll go easy on you if you put a one integration sign instead of two for double integrals. But for triple integrals, you should put more than one. For double integrals, I will be, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be lenient on double integrals in terms of this, how many integral signs you put. Okay, let me put two signs here, though. So integral over this m, you'll be able to write as a double integral over d, where here you will put f, where again you put x of uv, y of uv, and z of uv. And then you will put r sub u cross r sub v. This is a cross product. Again, something we learned before. And then you take the magnitude of this vector, dA. dA is the usual measure of integration on, on the uv plane. So this term, ru cross rv, is just like this term, which you have for integrals of functions over, um, over curves, the first type of integral. It's the analog. It's the analog of that. That that uh, R u cross R v absolute value is the analog of this. Okay. So now the question really becomes: How do you parameterize it? Once you parameterize it, once you parameterize it, it's very easy because you just need to compute the derivatives and you take the cross product and you end up with a, with just an ordinary double integral. But the question is: How do you how do you compute this? So, well, there are, there are at least two special cases which you should know. The first special case is when your, your surface is part of a graph. It's part of, gra of the graph of a function. In this case, the formula simplifies. And in fact, it's a good idea to remember, uh, to remember this formula. Well, you will actually have a cheat sheet, so you, might as well, you, you can just write it on the cheat sheet. You don't have to remember. Okay, so special cases. The first special case is when, when, the, when the surface M is part of the graph of some function G of X, Y. So in this case, what we can do is we can just say that X is U y is v, and z is g of u v, OK? Or we can just stop pretending that u and v are two separate, are two additional auxiliary variables, and just call them what they are. I mean, let's just call these auxiliary variables x and y. So then the parameterization will be in terms of x and y, and we'll have x is x, y is y, and z is g of x, y. So in this case, actually, you can compute this cross product. And this has been done. I, I did it in class. I, I wrote this formula in class. The computation is explained in the book. You must have done it many times on homework. So you might as well just remember this formula. And the formula is like this. It's minus gg dx minus dg dy. So this is i, this is j, plus k, if I remember it correctly. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's correct. This formula you just get by applying, by applying that general formula in this particular case. It's just that when you compute the cross product, so you have to compute this, um, you know, the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix, it's just that the matrix becomes very simple and it simplifies so it's easy to compute. I'm sorry? That's right. I did not close a parenthesis, for which I apologize. <laughs> okay. No, please, please tell me, because we, we, we want our worldwide audience to, to see only the correct, only correct formulas. So, okay. And now, if you have this, you can compute its, 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 um, its magnitude very easily. And so it's just going to be the sum, square root of the sum of squares of these components. So it's like this. OK? 
Okay? So we actually have not just the, the magnitude, but we actually have a formula for the cross product, which I will use in a minute. Okay, so that's the first special case. There is a second special case. When your surface is part of a sphere. The second special case is M is part of the sphere. Of the sphere of some radius. Let's call this radius r. So this, this radius r is just a number. So, so you got a sphere which is uh, of, of this radius. And your m could be just the entire sphere. Could be the entire sphere. Okay? Or it could be hemisphere. Or it could be part of the sphere which is within, confined within a cone. It's like an ice cream cone. Right? And that's just, that's just the surface of the ice cream. So in each of, this, uh, in each of these cases, a good uh, way to parameterize such a, such a surface is to use spherical coordinates. Spherical coordinates we learned before. Sphe a spherical, coordinate, co spherical coordinates give us an alternative coordinate system for the entire three-dimensional space. And we've got three coordinates. We've got rho, phi, and theta. But now we are on a sphere. We are on a sphere of radius r. So from the point of view of spherical coordinates, this coordinate rho is fixed. Rho, the coordinate of the spherical coordinates, is equal to r. Right? But we still have two remaining spherical coordinates which we can use to parameterize our surface. Which is good because the surface is two-dimensional, so it requires two independent coordinates. And phi and theta give us these two coordinates. So in other words, u and v here are phi and theta. For example, if it's the entire sphere, you will have theta going from 0 to 2 pi and phi going from 0 to pi which is the full range of phi and theta. If it's the upper hemisphere, again, theta will go from 0 to 2 pi, and phi will go from 0 to pi over 2. And here, um, theta is from 0 to 2 pi, and phi, well, phi, it depends how much ice cream you get. <laughs> so it's in your interest to have it. As, as large as possible, I guess. Although it, then it becomes more difficult to hold it. So let's just settle on the middle, middle ground, pi over 4. OK? So that's how you parameter. This is an example of parameterization. And now, in this, in this case, there is a formula also for, there is a formula for, let me erase this. So that's just, I write the formula for R. Um, u cross rv. But now we don't have u and v, we have phi and theta. And so r phi cross r theta in this case, and I'll just write the, the formula for the magnitude, is actually what you would expect it to be. It's exactly the formula for the Jacobian, except that you have to set rho equals r in here. So it's r squared times sine phi. You have a question? <laughs> Right. So, so the question is about the, the cone. How do I measure phi? Phi is measured from the z-axis, right? So 0 to pi over 4 would be this kind of range. Yeah? It works? Although I have to say, in this picture, it looks more, a little bit less than pi over 4. <coughs> I don't want to short change you with ice cream. But it's just uh, an approximate an approximate picture. Not the best day to eat ice cream in Berkeley, though. Perhaps earlier in the semester would have been more appropriate. OK, so that's the formula for this. And let's go back to this double integral. So that's all you need. You need this guy. You need your function where you stick those 
um, expressions coming from your parameterization. And then you end up with a simple double integral. So, so you compute it. What is the interpretation of this? What is the meaning of this? The meaning just like in the case of um, type 1 integrals for curves is that it represents something that has to do with the area or mass. It's something when, when you average density over your surface. So the typical example is that this is, it represents mass of, say, um, aluminum foil in the shape of M where f, this function f, which appears in that integral, f is the mass density function. Density function. Now, it doesn't have to be mass. It could be any quantity which you can measure, which can have a density. For instance, charge. This foil could be charged, but in a in a complicated way so that it's, some parts are more charged than others. So you have to integrate, you have to average them out. And um, so you can have a, F may be the charge density function, not necessarily mass density function. So then you would be calculating total charge. By the way, if it is mass, you can also talk about, about the momentum of the mass, which means that you would be multiplying in this under this integral F by X or Y or Z, right? So you can also find the center of mass for, um, for this membrane, for this surface. So if somebody, if the question is phrased in the following way, find the charge of a aluminum foil in the shape of such and such surface, if the, the charge density function is such and such function, then you immediately know that you have to do this integral. Okay? So that's the integral of the first kind or type 1 integral over surfaces. And next we go to uh, type 2 integrals. Type 2 integrals are integrals of vector fields. In this case, in this case, we, we are given a vector field F. We are given a vector field. And uh, we are computing this, which is oftentimes called, sometimes called surface integral of the vector field, but oftentimes it's also called flux. Flux of F across M. So the word flux, if you see the word flux, it refers to the integral of the second type. And I explain what it means. It means uh, the uh, flow, the rate of flow of, for example, of a, of a fluid through this membrane. If f is a velocity vector field. So this integral actually was defined originally uh, as as follows. We we said that we have to take the dot product of f with the, with the unit normal vector field along along m. Then this will be a function, and then we take its integral as a type 1 integral. So this definition already makes, it, makes clear that we need orientation. We need a choice of n. So just like the integrals of second type for curves are not really well defined if you just specify a vector field and the surface. Integrals of the second type are also not well defined if you just specify vector field on the surface. You have to specify orientation on your surface. So it's exactly the same. We need orientation. And the orientation should be given to you if, it's a, if you have to solve a problem. The orientation, if, if, you're give, if you are given a problem where you have to compute the flux of a vector field across a given surface. The problem has to say what is the orientation, or there should be a way to find which orientation 
uh, it's supposed to be, okay? Now, again, there are two different types of orientation. There are two different orientations. In case the surface is orientable, but of course, we'll, we'll be dealing with orientable surfaces. I explained to you Möbius Möbi strip, remember? Möbius strip is an example of a surface which is not orientable. But we will be working with orientable surfaces. So an orientable surface will have two different types, two different orientations, which they will differ by a sign. So how do you find out which one, which orientation to use? So let me, first of all, rewrite this. To make it computable as a double integral. So again, I am assuming that my surface is parameterized in this way by these functions in u and v, okay? And in this case, this double integral will be written as follows. It will be double, int double integral over this domain d that you have there. And then here you'll have f dot ru cross rv. I mean, in principle, you could try to compute this integral by using this n. And there are different ways, there are different ways to try to find this normal vector, okay? A unit normal vector. So you could actually apply this formula and, and, and then compute this integral as a type one integral. You could compute as a type one integral, but I think, I suggest, I strongly suggest that you use it as, you use this formula for it, okay? This, because the point is that it's easy, there are many ways to find a normal vector. Um, for instance, you know, we talked about normal vectors for graphs of function, functions, for example. But what you need to do after this, you have to first of all normalize it. You have to get a normal vector of unit length. You have to normalize it. And then, in addition, you will have to compute this ds, which itself is a, is a rather complicated task, right? You have to compute this ds, as, which we here compute as the magnitude of ru cross rv. The nice thing about this formula is that this formula is obtained from this formula where, instead of n, you take uh, this ru cross rv, which you normalize by dividing by its magnitude. So what happens is that there is some consolation. This norm this magnitude gets canceled by the same magnitude in the, in the denominator. So the formula actually simplifies. That's why I think that it's, this formula is nicer. So you, it's easy to get confused if you use a different type of formula. I mean, you can do it at your own risk, if you know, if you like, if you, if you know what I mean. But I'm just, I just think that this is the best way to do it in the framework for, for the kind of problems that we are, we are dealing with here. Okay. So, but, so here's the formula, but how do you see if this is the right answer and not it's negative? You see, so this is a, this is a big question. How to see, to see that you get the right orientation? In this formula. In other words, you could have a, you could have a problem, say, where you are asked where you are asked uh, to compute, to use the orientation, to compute with respect to the orientation, upward orientation. So let's say you're asked to use the upward orientation. How do you know that this formula gives you the, uh, the integral with the upward orientation and not the downward orientation, for example, right? So first of all, what, what is, do we mean by upward orientation? It means that you have to choose n of the form something times i plus something times j, where this doesn't matter, plus something which is positive times k. This is upward. And if I put less than zero here, it will be downward. So that's the terminology. Upward vector is a vector whose k component or z component is positive. And uh, downward vector is a vector which has a negative z component. 
Okay. So let's say you're asked to compute uh, the, the integral over, over surface, assuming the um, upward orientation. And you have this formula. And the natural question is, does this formula give me the upward orientation or it gives me a downward orientation? We have to check that because if it does give me the upward orientation, I will get the right answer. If it gives me downward orientation, then I would get the minus sign. I will get negative of the right answer. So, I will, so it means I will get the wrong answer. Right? If I get the wrong answer, it means that I don't get the full uh, score on this problem. Right? So how do you see that? Well, here's an example. Let's look at some special cases where this actually can be computed more explicitly. And the first case is, that, is the case when M is part of the, of the graph. So for example, let's look at the case when example M is part of the graph of the function G of XY. In this case, we have already computed Rx cross RV, uh, Ry. It is written on this formula. This is Rx cross Ry. So let's, let, me <clears throat> let me just copy this formula here. So this formula, in this formula, the coefficient in front of i and the coefficient in front of j depends on, the, on, the, on this function that you have, of which you are, uh, you know, which gives you this graph, right? So this, this coefficients depend, but this coefficient is always equal to one. So this, is a co this coefficient is one. So it's positive. And so that means that if you are using this formula for Rx cross Ry, right? If you're using this formula for Rx cross Ry, then you are getting orientation or you are computing, this formula is computing the integral with respect to the upward orientation. You see, so this is an important point. That a priori, it could be, uh, this gives you a normal vector, not normalized, not unit, but it gives you a normal vector. And, and by looking at this vector, you can find out with respect to which orientation you are now computing. And then you have to match that with what you're asked to do. In this case, Rx cross Ry, so you have to look more closely at this vector and see what does it look like qualitatively. In this particular case, the, easy, the simplest information we can infer about this vector is the fact that the coefficient in front of k is one, so it is upward. It's always upward. So now you match, you see, okay, so what am I asked to do? I'm asked to do a double integral, surface integral with respect to the upward orientation. Oh, is my orientation upward? Yes, it is. So this is the right formula. F dot Rx cross Ry is the right formula. Is the right formula. If that in for, for up for um, upward orientation. But what if I want to trick you and I ask you, and I ask you on the test, I ask you to compute the double integral, compute the surface integral with respect to the downward orientation. If you don't pay attention, if you just, you have copied this formula on your cheat, on your cheat sheet, right? And you've copied this formula on your cheat sheet. And so you think you're in good shape. You just apply this formula and you get an answer. But you get the wrong answer because you did not pay attention to what was asked. You were asked to, to compute with respect to downward orientation, but you computed with respect to the upward orientation. Just simply because the formula you are using always gives you upward. But I have the right to ask you to compute with respect to downward orientation. You know, both integrals make sense. It's my, it's, um, it's my right and my prerogative, in fact, to, to ask you to define any, to ask you to compute with respect to any orientation that I like. So in that case, you have to be clever and you have to put a minus sign. So 
So this is the right formula. This is for downward orientation. Because putting this minus sign, you can interpret it as putting, it min the, putting the minus sign in front of Rx cross Ry. If I put it in front of Rx cross Ry, I will get plus here, plus here, and most importantly, I get minus one here. If I get minus one here, I got orientation vector which is downward. So that matches what I'm asked to do, right? To do the downward orientation. So that's why this is the correct formula. Is this clear? Ask me, ask me quite, ask me if I could. Okay, go ahead. Right. I'll give another example in a minute for when it's not upward or downward. Um, if your uh, coefficient is the same as zero, um, what is Very good. What if the coefficient was, is zero? So, okay, in this case, it's ne it never happens, right? Because in this case, it's just always like this. So, so here's, an, here's a, uh, in the next level of, of trick question, which is that suppose it's some RU cross RV, okay? But for some other u and v. And suppose it just happens that the component of the k vector is zero, right? In this case, I should not be asking you to compute with respect to upward or downward orientation. Because if, it has, if its com k component is zero, it means it's parallel to the xy plane, right? So it's neither upward nor downward. And saying that compute with respect to upward orientation would be misleading in other words, or ambiguous. It will not give you any information. Because uh, not, neither of the two vectors is upward or downward, right? So in this case, you actually have to use another way to describe it, okay? So what are other ways to say? We have to describe in words, you know, the, the, the possible, there are two possibilities. You have to be able to distinguish between them. If the k component is non-zero, you can distinguish between the sign of k, right? You can say if pos positive sign or negative sign. But if it is zero, for example, you can talk about the sign of the, co of the coefficient in front of j. Even in this case, here's another trick question I could ask. Instead of saying compute this integral, even in this case when it's part of a graph, instead of saying it's the upward or downward, I could say compute it uh, with respect to the orientation, which is to the left. Okay? So what does it mean? What should you do if you see that? Don't panic. It's, uh, if, you're, uh, if, you're, uh, if the orientation is described in terms of left, right, it means we are talking about the y coordinate, right? Instead of the z coordinate, which would be k, we're talking about the y coordinate, which would be j, right? So to the left would mean that the coefficient is negative. And to the right would mean that the coefficient in front of j is positive. Now, of course, in this case, it's not clear. It depends on the function g. Sometimes just the fact that there's a minus sign here doesn't mean anything because the function could be negative. So then the total sign would be positive and, and so on, right? But in the particular example which you are computing, you should be able to see if it's positive or negative over that range, you see? So what I'm saying is, what you are interested in is just the piece of the, of, of the graph. So you are working with a particular domain D in UV. And you have to see whether over this domain a certain coefficient is positive or negative, right? That's all it is. And for example, suppose you find that RU cross RV let me now switch to the more general setting where you actually have coordinates u and v, and it's not necessarily graph of a function, but some other more general surface. So you could have ru cross rv is equal to some, you know, some um, a of uv i plus b of uv j plus c of uv k. This is what you will compute by taking, by taking these partials and, and taking the cross product. So you'll get three functions. And then you just have to look closely. What do they look like? Well, let's say this is u squared plus v squared. OK? So, th okay, so then it's not 1, but it's going to be positive. 
Well, the only point where it will not, would not be positive would be 0, 0. So let's suppose that your domain does not include point zero zero. So then it's always positive. If you look, if you see that, you know that the coefficient in front of j is positive, which means that the orientation vector is pointing to the right. Right? Because, because this is what, this is x. Well, of course, when we say, when we say that, it's all relative to how we uh, organize our coordinate system. What do we mean by left and right? But there is a way which we're kind of used to, which would be like x goes this way and y goes this way, and this is a z, right? So, so in this case, to the right means that it's a positive number in front of j. To the left means it's a, it's a negative number in front of j. So in this case, it's going to be a vector, not necessarily like this, but maybe like this. So this is to the right. And for the left, it's this way. Is that clear? There is another way to describe orientation by using the word outward and inward. So usually, this is often used for spheres or for closed domains. Okay? So that's another way. Um, and that should be also pretty self-explanatory. So at the end of the day, you have to compute the formula by using RU cross RV. But the bottom line is what you get is either the correct answer or Either the answer which, if you put in this, if you stick in here, you get the correct answer, or it's negative. So it's, it becomes fine-tuning issue. Is it correct, or should I put a minus sign? So then you match the description of the orientation, which is given in words, upward, downward, left, right, to what you got. And usually it should be fairly easy to see. And then that's how you see whether you got the right answer, so you use that formula without any modification, or you put a negative sign. That's all it is. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Right. So what if the sign changes? If the sign changes, of course, then the description would not be uh, correct, I mean, well-defined, right? So the, the description should be such that if it says to the right, it means that that coefficient should stay positive or negative or whatever, right? OK. All right. So, so that's about the setup of the integrals. And now I want to say a few words about the connection between different integrals. These are the formulas which we've learned. So this is two formulas. So we essentially, we have essentially learned three different formulas. We have the fundamental theorem of, of line, for line integrals. We have Stokes formula. And then we have divergence theorem. <laughs> okay. So now I have explained. Oh, also, um, Green's theorem is a special case of this. when M actually belongs to the plane. It's a special case of this. So that's why I didn't single it out. OK? So I already explained the kind of the general theory behind this and how you can, you can think of all of these formulas as special cases of one and only formula. What I would like to focus now is the practical aspects of this. How you can you apply these formulas to computing integrals of the type that we have just discussed. So here, I would like to emphasize, first of all, the following aspect of these formulas. That in these formulas, always, 
there is a trade-off between the sort of a boundary, the sort of a geometric boundary of a domain, and uh, a sort of derivative of the object <laughs> that you are integrating. There's a trade-off. On the left, it's a general domain of integration, but the integrand is special. In the first formula, you're computing only line integrals of vector fields of this form, the gradients, the conservative vector fields. In this formula, integrals only of curls, of something which is a curl of another vector field. Here, you compute a function which is divergence of some vector field. So they're kind of derivative of other objects. But the domains are most general. Most general curve, most general surface, most general three-dimensional solid. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, you have the most general uh, object. Here, general function. Here, general vector field. Here, also general vector field. But you're integrating over domains, which are kind of derivatives of the domains on the left-hand side, where in the geometric world, derivative means boundary. So this is a very important point to remember when you decide which formula is appropriate for this or that exercise, or this or that computation. So on the right-hand side, you've got general integrand, but special domain, namely boundary. Uh, domain. This is derivative. Here is derivative. Here is boundary. Okay. So the most so so don't try to use the formula where, for example, where just on these grounds you can rule it out. In other words, or don't use it in, the, in a straightforward way. Use it, use it in a more creative way. You see, so. So let me give you just uh, two examples of how these formulas could be used. So example one. So let's suppose you have, you, you're asked to compute the line integral of a vector field. But the curve, the, the curve over which you have to compute is very complicated. So this is the first indication that you should replace the domain of integration. Okay? So in this case, let's say you are asked to compute this. So the clever thing to do is to replace this domain by this, uh, this uh, um, curve by this curve, which has the same endpoints, right? And then you can argue that this line integral is equal to, so let's call this C1, and let's call this C2. This line integral is equal to integral over C2, of FDR minus uh, uh, plus the, in, the double integral of curl <coughs> FDS, where you integrate over the interior of this domain. You see? So you can use this formula. Let's call this D. Or M. Let's call it M. Okay. So the reason is the following, that if you take this to the left-hand side, you will get negative C2, right? I'm, just, I'm writing it like this because I prefer to say this is equal to this plus something. But I could put this integral to the left with minus sign, which means I'm integrating over C1 minus C2. And then you have to see that this is a boundary of M. C1 minus C2 would be going with this orientation, and that would be boundary of M. 
Now, if, if I do if I do it like this, there is a, there is a, there is a, there, this brings brings up another issue, which is the issue of orientation in this formula. So I'm I'm using this formula, but in both cases I have integrals which depend on orientation, and we have this rule for orientations, okay, which um, which we discussed already many times. So orientation on the left and on the right have to match in, the, in this way where if you walk on the boundary and then the surface is in your left. So the way I did it right now would mean that the orientation on this surface would have to go that way. Okay? So here it will be the surface where orientation is um, going to, through the blackboard. The usual orientation, which we you normally consider, would be this orientation towards us, right? And that's the orientation which we would get with counterclockwise. But here I have chosen the orientation which goes clockwise. Well, because I also put minus C2, so I reverse this. And um, so this will be the orientation with orientation. Let's call it away from us. Not towards us, but away from us. Because if somebody would be walking, if their feet are on the blackboard, but their head points that way, so they'd be walking in, this, in, that, in that classroom, it would be like Spider-Man. And, and they would be walking also on uh, like this bizarre world, which is behind this blackboard, which we don't even know what's going on over there. right? But if that person would be walking um, like this, the surface would be on their left. Right. So normally, if, we, if I were to walk like this, I would have to walk counterclockwise for the surface to be on my left. Right. So if I wanted to have orientation here towards us, I would have to, for this formula to be true, I would have to choose uh, opposite orientation. But, so I'm putting sort of several things into this example because I'm, I'm out of time essentially, but I'm trying to sort of pack a lot of information into this one example. So you should really look at it more carefully and at different aspects of this, okay? The orientations have to be compatible, and there is one more thing which I'm doing here, which is that I'm replacing a complicated path by an, an easy path, a simple path. And the trade-off is that this guy is equal to this one, but there is a price to pay. And the price is the double integral over this membrane over this sort of a film. Think of it as sort of like a film that you get from, uh, from soap. It's like a frame and there is a kind of a soap. So you have to integrate over that the curl. The best possible scenario where this works is when curl is zero. If curl is zero, there is no price to pay. And in fact, this complicated integral over this complicated curve is equal, is just straight equal to the integral here. But sometimes it's not zero. Sometimes it's not zero, but it could be very simple. So it's not such a big price to pay sometimes. You see, you see what I mean? So you have to, you have to be careful, you have to see different, different options, the different options that you have. So this is one example where I'm utilizing formula number two. And um, let me give you one more example, which is kind of similar, but for formula number three. So maybe I should, uh, I should emphasize here that in these formulas, orientations have to be compatible. Have to be compatible. This is important. I'm not going to explain it one more time because we spent a lot of time talking about this in the previous few lectures. So example number two. Example number two, you can kind of a similar trade-off, but where you have to compute a double integral. So let's say you have 
this upper hemisphere. And then you also have this disk at the base of this upper hemisphere. And together, they form the boundary of the upper half of this ball. So let's call this B, uh, upper half of a ball. So then, the last formula would tell you that the integral of divergence of some vector field E over this B is equal to the, int the flux through this surface, th through the boundary. And the boundary now consists of two things. Let's call this M1 and let's call this M2. So the formula then will be that it's int double integral over M1 plus double integral over M2. But I have to say, with respect to which orientation, and the rule in the divergence theorem is that the orientation is outward, which here would mean like this, and here would mean like this. Here it's outward actually is upward on the top part, and on the bottom outward is actually downward. But both, both are outward. So that's what I mean here and here. So how can we utilize this formula? For example, what you can do is you can express this as the difference between this and this. You see? So this way, you can express a complicated integral over something very curved, the sphere or upper hemisphere, in terms of two flat integrals. One of them is over a three-dimensional solid, which actually may be quite simple, depending on what... Mm, I made a mistake like this, dv. It could actually be zero, this divergence. It could be zero, so then this actually drops out. And then you can express this guy as negative of this guy, right? Or even if it's non-zero, it could be something very simple, like one, function one or something. So then it's easy to compute. And this one is certainly easy to compute, easier to compute than this one, because it's an integral over a flat region. So you have this trade-off, again, similar to the trade-off discussed in the previous example between an integral over one part of the boundary and the integral over the other part of the boundary with a surplus or price to pay coming from the integral of the divergence. So these are very typical examples of the kind of things that you need to, um, to know to be able to apply these formulas. Okay? So, so here's what we're going to do now. I'm going to stop and we're going to do uh, course evaluations. It'll just take a few minutes, okay? Come on guys, come on over so we'll, uh, we'll start distributing them. And um, we'll just take a few minutes. And after this, after we're done with course evaluations, I'll, I'll be here for, for office hours. And so you can ask me questions about anything, well, related to the course. Okay?